if she had lost her daughter. It was a long time before they found her body. But I saw her and she was happy and playing. I could see her. I could see her face. I can see her right now. And uh, she was so happy. And she really wanted that message to get to her mom. And I, and I got to share it with her. Years later, I lost my children. So I dedicated my life to, uh, to hospice and to terminally ill children. After hearing your stories, it appears as though you have like this gift of seeing. And yes. yeah, and I would say you're clairvoyant. I don't know if that's how you identify or if you see yourself that way, but that's what I see when I'm right. watching you speak. Um, but you did have an NDE when you were young. Can we start yes. there? Would you mind sharing what happened? Sure. When I was a child, I was raised on a farm and we had a lot of farm animals, a lot of chickens, and I had developed a lung infection that um, put me in the hospital for the better part of about a year and a half. I would go in and out, in and out. And uh, now the infection, if you get it, I think you just take a couple pills and you're done with it. But back then there was, uh, we didn't have any fungal um, uh, medications like we do today. So I would uh, go to Children's Hospital and I would be there for a couple of weeks or a month or so at a time. And uh, as I was finally um, uh, making another repeat visit, there was this one nurse that uh, always took care of me. Uh, of course, I got to know a lot of the nurses since I was uh, uh, coming in and out of the hospital. There's this one I always liked and she took uh, extra good care of me. And one day, what again, what something went wrong and uh, the doctors are coming in and they're working on me and they're you know, pounding and sticking needles. And um, I was kind of used to it and going through the pain and going through all the agony that was going that they were doing to me. I um, I just all at once just felt happy and sat up and got out of my bed. And, uh, I walked away and there, you know, they were doing something in the bed and I just walking out the room and going out the, the door and into the hallway. And, uh, um, as I'm going down the hallway, it was an old hospital, had huge hallways, huge ceilings, wide, wide, uh, hallways. And there'd be, you know, nurses pushing patients in wheelchairs and people walking, coming and going. And, um, all at once there, I saw it looked like a huge ball of people. They were off-white. Um, it uh, it was more like a pen and ink sketch. It was like the outline of all these people. And it was like people without bones because they were able to swirl in and out, hundreds of them, in a perfectly round sphere of bodies. And I could see their faces and their arms and their hands and their rear ends and their shoulders. And they would just swirl in and out, in and out, constant movement. And their heads would pull back and their mouths would grotesquely open, almost like they were screaming or something, and, and just swirl and swirl and swirl. And I would stand there and I was just looking at this. It was like, oh, my God, what is this? I had no idea. And as I'm watching it, up to my left side, this little girl came and she said to me, um, you want to go play? And I'm like, sure. You know, I'm a kid. I'm probably six, seven years old. And um, uh, so we go down a hallway and we all at once were outside. And there was these other kids playing. And there was this one thing she really wanted to play with. It was a pole with a bunch of rope hanging from it. And you grab it and you kind of run around in a circle. Wasn't that much fun. Uh, later, I asked, I described it to my mom and she said, well, that's a maypole. It was something that they used to do years and years ago. So we played with that. There was a big ball. We kind of played with the ball and the other kids are playing, but this little girl and I, it was just she and I playing together. And she had a, a dark complexion. She had really long, thick hair and it was braided right down the middle of her back. She was wearing a little checkered, um, 
uh, kind of an auburn red uh, pinafore. And uh, then she came up to me and she says, um, you, we can play a little bit longer, but you can't stay here. And I said, well, why can't I? I'm having a blast. You know, it beats being in bed, you know, getting needles stuck in you. And we played a little bit longer. And then she came up to me and said, uh, my name's Penny. Tell my mom I love her. And uh, I was back in my room. And I remember getting back in the bed and uh, again, here comes all these doctors and the needles and all the stuff that they were doing. Um, back then we were, uh, they would have us in oxygen tents. We were covered by, with sheets of plastic and that's what kept the oxygen in. Now they got little nasal prongs that they put in or, or put a ventilator in. And I, you know, I was back in the body and I was all in pain and, Whatever happened, I survived, um, you know, whatever the medical emergency was. Well, later on, this, um, this woman came, that, the nurse that I had seen so many times, and I just instinctively knew this was Penny's mother. And I was just all excited. Well, you know, I was playing with Penny. I can't wait to give her the message. And I told her, I said, um, I saw Penny. You know, we were playing. She said to tell you that she loved you. And she just kind of freaked and backed up and, and walked out of the room. And I never saw her again. She never came back in the room. And it was much later, um, my mom told me that she had quit, that um, she had lost her daughter, Penny. Penny had been ice skating on a pond. This is back in Ohio. And the ice broke and she went under the water. And it was a long time before they found her body. But, um, but I saw her and she was happy. And playing. I could see her. I can see her face. I can see her right now. And uh, she was so happy. And she really wanted that message to get to her mom. And, and I got to share it with her. You know, what a wonderful thing that was. What a gift. I'm sorry I freaked her out. But uh, maybe that was the release that she need, needed. I did the same thing. You know, I, years later, I lost my children. And mm. uh, so I dedicated my life to uh, to hospice and to terminally ill children. And um, that's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you what, what made you go into hospice? I had um, two marvelous little boys. And um, their mother had cancer. We were young. This was 1989, so you know, I was in my mid-30s. And um, the mother had cancer. I was a nurse. And my best friend was dying at the same time. So I moved him into the house. I took care of my best friend um, at, and then um, the boy's mother, when we were officially married, um, took care of her, through, uh, both of them, through their final years. Plus, I worked full-time and then was basically already a, a single parent to the boys and took care of them. It was really tough. She died. Um, and then, uh, and my friend died. And then I was the single parent with, uh, uh, my two sons. Three months after their mother died, I was in the house. The boys were in the front yard and playing, uh, you know, in our own yard and. Uh, somebody decided um, to drink and drive and drove clear up in the yard. And uh, I heard this horrible commotion and um, heard the neighbors screaming. And, you know, so I'm going outside and I'm looking out the door and there's somebody's car in the front yard. And uh, there's all this red. And uh, I just, I just kind of backed off. I just kind of froze. And I'm a nurse. I know what happened, but just I couldn't move. And uh, of course, the red was their blood. They had driven right over them and killed my boys in my oh own front yard. God, I am so oh, sorry, God. Dave. Um, the neighbors were fabulous. I mean, they're over there and, and trying to pull them out from underneath the car, and and this the driver's just wandering around like, you know, it's not my fault. And, um, and I just stood there. I couldn't do anything. I just stood there. 
Um, fabulous neighbors. They helped me through. The uh, in-laws came through, uh, helped with all the, the funeral. And, um, you know, my boss told me, just take as much time as you need. And, and I just sat in the house. And finally, I just never went back to work. Um, uh, I ended up sitting in the house for a solid year. And with all the spirit encounters I've had throughout my life, you know, and I know there's so much more. I have seen so much from childhood through my whole uh, adult life. Still, this was something, it knocked me for a loop to lose your children. And so quick, it's just, you know, they're laughing and playing one minute and then the silence just screams. You can't imagine. How, how painful silence is when you're used to laughter and happiness and having your kids. And that was devastating to me. It was the, it was the silence. I'll never see him again. Though I knew about spirit. Still, um, I, I just couldn't go back to work. And I'd look out the window and I'd see people walking their dogs and driving their cars and thinking, how can you be having a life? Because my world stopped. How is your world still going on? I just wasn't dealing well with it. So I closed the curtains. And then after that, I, I remember I had gallons of paint. So I actually painted over the windows so no light could come in. And I just sat in the darkness for a solid year. And um, when their mother died, you know, I got some insurance money. So I was able to you know, make the house payments and keep everything going. And I just sat there and, and my friends would come over and bring me food and check on me. And they were so supportive and they never tried to tell me to, you know, get out of it, shake up, you know, come on, let's get going. They just, you know, what can I do? What can I bring you next time? And I'd order pizzas and I never left the house. So one day, a year later, I'm watching TV in the living room, total darkness. And in the corner of the room, there is these little sparks, uh, like diamonds glistening in the sun. There's just a few and then more and more and more and more and more. And uh, finally, it was like a rectangle, maybe about three feet wide and maybe about a foot tall. And, um, uh, loads of sparks, uh, like a sparkler shining, um, uh, burning. And I thought, oh my God, it's an electrical fire. Now what am I going to do? I can't leave the house. And out of this rectangle of sparks, I heard two voices and they were like young executives, um, very well educated, uh, very, um, uh, very, uh, well spoken and very angry. And they started almost shouting at me, this has got to stop. We got so much work to do here and you're holding us back. It is so important what we're doing and we have got to do. So many people are relying on what we're doing, but we can't get it done because of you, 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 you're hanging on. And because you're hanging on, we can't move forward and it's got to stop right now. And they, it took turns telling me off. It was, it was like going to HR about to get Whoa. fired. They were like me. Let me have it. And I just instinctively knew it was my voice. And I kept, I was just staring at the little twinkling lights and the voices came, kept coming. Uh, this is, you have no idea what you're interfering with. Your holding on is stopping us and we can't do the work that we need to do. And you need to back off and you need to back off now. This went on and on and on. One of them, they took turns and, and one had, a, they had different voices. And uh, one of them said, the only nice thing they said, we appreciate what you did for us. And that was it. And that was right back into you, you, you. Uh, it's all about you. Hang on. We'll stop. Stop. We're coming this time. We're not coming back. We're not telling you again, but you need to back off. You need to back off. I mean, they're just telling me. And finally, I'm saying, okay, you know, I get it. I'm sorry. I had no idea I was holding you back. I miss you. I'm your father. 
I mean, we, uh, we had Christmas together. We, you know, we played together. I changed your diapers. And uh, they weren't having any of it. It was like, well, this is it. And the voices stopped. And this thing of light, this sparkling rectangle of light started getting smaller and smaller and smaller, just like how it had appeared. And finally, there was just a few. And then it went out. And I'm back in the darkness and the TV's on. And, you know, I'm sitting here with my bowl of cereal. And uh, it's like, oh, my God, you know, okay, I got the message. Well, I instantly, you know, got up and I called work. I said, you know, I've been gone for a year. Uh, my boss is gone and she would have hired me, right, hired me right back. But everybody knew me. They said, well, sure, come in and, <clears throat> and make a, uh, put in an application. So I got, <clears throat> I got cleaned up and I showered and shaved and I had to have someone come over and jump my car because I hadn't started it in a year. And I went in like two hours later at work and I'm putting in my application. They knew me, so they went ahead and hired me, and I started work again the next day, 24 wow. hours after this. It was like, you know, I, I went to 180 degrees in such a short period. What a wake-up call that was. That was that, a healing uh, moment for you right oh there. Oh, my gosh. Like transformative. You know, if they had... If they had said, oh, daddy, we miss you, we love you, we wish you were there, I would still be in that house in the dark. But they told me off. They had stuff to do. There is a whole new life going on for them. And truly, there's a big difference between mourning someone and missing someone. And, and mourning isn't healthy at all. Missing somebody, you know, you can deal with that. That's fine. And I changed. I changed in seconds from morning to missing and totally learned uh, the lesson of letting go. I've never seen them since. Um, wow. Dave, but, when, uh, they were, when they were in the room, were could you hear their voice like you're hearing my voice or was it yes. telepathic? Huh? Well, it sounded like I was hearing it auditory. I, who knows? That's a good question. But they had distinct um, adult male voices. I mean, it was crystal clear. So that's, that's a good question. I wonder. It sounded real, but, but who knows? Yeah, that's I mean, that, If there was a camera on, who knows what would have caught? You know, would anybody else have seen the light? I don't know. It was quite obvious and it was putting off a glow. Uh, so it was just like know. little, like sparks that you were seeing. You didn't see their bodies or their silhouettes. It was just that they were coming from the light. From the light, sparks. Loads of them, thousands of them, condensed, very, very compact, you know, uh, three feet by one feet in a, in a rectangle. And it was just in the corner of the room. And I just kept staring at it. I'm like, look, I can see it right now. And the voices came from that area and just went on and on and on. They didn't want to hear anything. They didn't even want to hear, I'm sorry for me. They just, they just let me have it. And it's exactly what I needed. And, exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I changed my paradigm in, you know, a couple minutes and, uh, and went right back to work. And it was interesting because my friends, I told them about this and the course, I think, oh, that's so cool. Cause they've seen things too. But now I've got all the windows painted, painted because I had them painted to block out the light. And, uh, and I had huge windows. So I had these little tiny one inch razors. So I had to start scraping the paint off. And my friend says, you know what, we'll come over and we'll have a party and we'll all scrape paint. And I said, you know, thank you, but I need to do this. Now, I'm the one that put up the paint. I'm the one that thought I could block out the light, but you can't. You can't block out the light. Mm -hmm. And how healing it was, even though my fingers were incredibly sore for like a month and a half, to go through the house and scraping, you know, inch after inch. Of, uh, of paint off these huge windows. It was, it was something I needed to do because I learned my lesson. You can't, you can't block out the light. It's always there. You can turn your back against it. You can shut your eyes and pretend it's not there. You can, uh, put glasses on and think you're going to filter it out. It's always there. It's always shining. And it's our, it's our perspective. 
how much of the light that we're going to enrich our lives with. Are we going to look at the light? Are we going to allow it to shine in? Are we going to turn our heads and, uh, and look another way? And, um, that's when I, uh, I learned a very valuable lesson that, um, it's a choice. All of it's a choice. The light's always shining. People tell me, well, I don't have these experiences. Well, you're, you probably got your windows painted. Mm, that's it's, beautiful. Um, that's yeah. such a great metaphor. So to open up to spirit, to open up to the light itself, all you have to do is such a simple thing is to remove anything that you've put there that disconnects you from the light. Mine was paint. You know, we, we, uh, we pack a, uh, uh, we stack up packages and crap and, uh, and, you know, it hurts and, and shame and guilt and all this other stuff. We pile it up between us and the light. Mm-hmm. And it's something we've done. It's not what it's done. And you don't have to read a zillion books. Uh, on, you know, how to connect with God or spirit or whatever you want to call. All you got to do, the universe makes it so simple. All you got to do is remove everything that distracts you from the light. That's it. That's all you got to do. And you can do it like that. You can do it in a flash. You can do it as fast as, you know, I changed uh, from being in a dark house for a year to uh, you know, taking care of others. So. A fabulous lesson I learned. The light is always on. It's just mm-hmm. about us becoming aware that it's there. It's simple as that. And you don't have to join religions if you want to. That's great. But um, uh, it doesn't need it. It, uh, it loves us. It cares for us. And it does what it can to get us to, to draw closer to it. And I know so many people I hear... I get some emails every now and then and they're saying, well, why am I not seeing this? Why is this not happening to me? Spirit doesn't necessarily step down to our level to have some meaningful experiences. Spirit pulls us closer to it. We need to step up to spirit's level not wait for spirit to step down to our level. So the more you appreciate whatever experience that you've had in your life and spirit can do it. Spirit's got like a kind of a kicky little sense of humor sometimes. And it'll send like odd little things like a dime on the sidewalk or a bird will fly by and do something weird. Or, you know, you get lost and you're going down the wrong street and there's a sign that has the word, to a problem you've been thinking of. It kind of does little weird things like that. And the more you recognize those, those kitschy little tiny coincidences, I love that word coincidence. Uh, the more you're stepping up a little bit and you're getting a little closer to spirits level and a little less out of your old level. And then you start having more and more and more experiences. That's exactly it. Yeah. So I have a a journal and I journal my synchronicities because where attention goes, energy flows, right? So if you pay attention to the signs and the symbols and you start noticing them, they're going to show up more. It's like you you raise your vibration to that level and it kind of opens that door. It's amazing. Yeah. That's you're spot on with that. I've noticed that in my own life. I would love for you to share your story about Lee, your friend Lee. How old were you? Um, I was probably about 12 years old. And uh, we later, and of course, you know, we went to everything. Um, We lived, we moved to a small farming community in the Midwest, very, very tiny town. And we were surrounded by cows and corn and some farmhouses. We, uh, you know, I was raised with my grandmother. We had no indoor plumbing. We had a a well in the backyard and an outhouse. So we finally moved to the small farming community. We're absolutely thrilled to have an indoor toilet and and running water. So it was, um, most people would call it just, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. To me, it was a blessing, you know, to have plumbing. And we had a, um, a small school. 
about half the kids were farming kids from the farming community. My mom had made friends with somebody in the next town over, which was even smaller. They didn't even have a grocery store. They didn't even have a post office. It was just, it was just like a bunch of houses. And there was a little Methodist church there. So we would go to church there. It was probably about 15 miles from our town and, um, and kind of hang out with, uh, with my mom's friends. Nice little church. And one day, um, um, we were going to church. It was, uh, the corn was pretty tall. So I'm going to say it was probably, um, July or August. Um, uh, maybe school was out, uh, at that time. And as we're driving down this road going to the church, there was, you know, again, just miles of corn. And then there'd be a little, uh, house, little farmhouse. And then there'd be a pasture of cows. And then, you know, more miles of corn. That's all there was corn and cows, corn and cows. And as we're driving down that road, I'm looking at something up in the uh, um, a little bit farther ahead. And it looked like a person was standing at the side of the road. And it really got my attention. And I kept staring at it and staring at it. And somehow I just knew it was Lee. It was my friend Lee from, from church. And he lived in um, uh, this other district, this other school district. But we were friends from church. And I was about 12 and he was about 16, something like that. And we always sat together in church and we went to the same Sunday school and, you know, hung out as much as we could. I really, really liked him. Nice kid. And uh, at the side of the road, there was a big ditch. And then there'd be like a little hill and then the pasture and a little hill because in the Midwest, we got so much rain it kept the rainwater from flooding the streets. And on this little hill, there was somebody standing there. And as we get closer and closer and closer, I saw it was, it really was Lee. And I tell my dad, my dad's driving, my mom's in the front seat and I'm in the back seat. I said, dad, there's Lee, there's Lee, stop. He might need some help. Whoosh, we just go right on by. And my dad said, well, I didn't see anything. And mom says, where's Lee? I didn't see Lee. So I think we were late for church and you know they just went on by. And I thought, well, you know, it's just kind of odd that Lee's out there in the middle of nowhere. And he was wearing black slacks and a nice white dress shirt, black shoes and a black belt. And he was just staring out at the horizon. And as we went by, it wasn't like he was trying to flag anybody down. He just stood there with his arms at his side, staring out at the horizon. I thought, well, you know, this is odd. When we get to church, I run down to Sunday school, which is like an hour before the church service. Lee's not there. And um, after the Sunday ser service, then we then go up and you know have the church service. And there's his parents crying. And at the end of the service, the minister says, we want everybody to um, say a prayer for you know Lee. Um, he's been missing for a couple of days and his parents are very, very worried. And, you know, my mom looks at me and says, don't say anything. And I'm saying, mm. So after the service, I went ahead and ran up to them and I said, I saw Lee. He was on the side of the road and I told my dad to stop and he didn't stop. Well, they're mad. And, uh, you know, they come up and run up, you know, my parents, why didn't you stop are we? and help our son? And, uh, you know, maybe he really needed help. We've been looking for him. And my, you know, my folks said, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't see him at all. So Lee's family gets in their car and they're following our car back to our little community. And I'm hoping I could find him because there's like no uh, no landmarks. It's just trees and gals and, and a farmhouse every now and then. And as we're driving down, uh, heading to our town and Lee's, Lee's folks in the car behind us, there he is. Now he's on the other side of the street because we're on the road because we're we're heading the opposite direction. And I tell my dad, slow down, slow down, slow down. There's like, shh, you just go right by him. I, I didn't see anything. So I open the car door and say, I'll go show you where he is. And he slams on the brakes and he's mad. And I get out and I run back to where I'm seeing Lee. Uh, Lee's parents pull up behind our car. They don't see him. My parents don't see him. I see him clear as day. And he's just standing there, standing on this little hill. And finally, I get there. And, uh, and I'm standing in front of him. And I'm looking up at Lee. And I say, Lee, here's your parents. You know, where have you been? They've been looking for you for a couple of days. And he's completely solid. But he's not looking at me. He's just look. He's looking over my head. 
So I'm standing down on the road. He's on this little hill of dirt. So he's about four feet over my head. And I keep yelling, here comes your parents. You're going to get in trouble. You know, doesn't move, doesn't look at me, doesn't respond or anything. And his parents come up and my parents come up and you know, saying, well, you know, what are you seeing? Who are you talking to? And I kept saying, there's Lee. He's right there. Don't you see him? They don't see him at all. My dad was much taller than I was. And in the little ditch by the side of the road between the um, uh, cornfield, is um, it was full of weeds. It was the Midwest. We get a lot, of, a lot of rain. And they generally would trim the weeds like in the fall. Well, my dad's able to look down and um, through the weeds, and he saw something. And he runs down in the weeds. He starts sinking in the mud, and he's pulling the weeds to the side. And I can see a handlebar sticking up in, in the weeds. And it ends up um, just a few days prior against his parents' wishes. Uh, Lee bought a motorcycle. And my dad's down there and pulling and pulling and pulling. And, and somebody was trapped underneath the motorcycle and he's pulling. And finally he stops. He says, it's Lee. He's gone. And it's like, oh my gosh. His mom passes out and falls on the road. And uh, he had much older parents. And uh, uh, Lee's dad's trying to take care of her. And I'm looking at her on the road. And so Lee would be by my right ear. And I heard him say so clearly, and I recognized his voice. He said, I'm sorry, Mom. And I turned and I looked at him. And, you know, he wasn't talking anymore. And he still just was looking out at the horizon. And uh, uh, my mom and uh, and... Lee's dad got the mom up to her feet. And I said, Lee just said, I'm sorry, mom. And, uh, you know, my dad's pulling, my dad's just covered in mud and finally frees his body and is pulling up his dead body, just covered with mud. Uh, by then other cars were stopping and, uh, people were coming up and helping my dad. My dad had me get in the car and just wait. It was like an hour later, we drive into town and the um, sheriff was out there and all the people that needed to be there were taking care of the accident. So we get home and, and uh, we had our supper and you know, we were talking. We were definitely very sad at the uh, losing Lee, but we were all talking about it. And it was like, this is not really all that odd for our family to have something like this to talk about over supper. And anyway, I'm, evening comes and I'm up in my room and there's a knock on the door. And, uh, it was, it was either a police or sheriff or something. It was some law enforcement. And there was a couple of them and they wanted to talk to me. So I said, well, you know, well, sure. You know, what can I tell you? Well, they didn't believe for a minute that I saw his spirit. They thought I killed Lee. And that's how I knew where his body was. And it's like at 12 years I'm, old, at 12 years old, out in, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, one of them accused me of running him off the road. Well, I had this rickety old bike, you know, but I, how am I going to run somebody, you know, 10 miles away out in the middle of nowhere on a motorcycle with my bike? And of all people, Lee, why would I do that? And it, there's no landmarks. I mean, even if you did know someone was dead there, you'd never find it. The only reason I found it because I saw him standing right over where his body was. Well, that's, they didn't let up and they came back. And then finally, my parents put up a buffer and wouldn't let him talk to me anymore. And my parents did the, uh, um, you know, whatever interviews that they needed and quoted me and asked me what I saw. And this is what I saw. And this is what happened. So as uh, school happens and, and um, start going back to school, um, a lot of the farming community, it was farmers, they were in a different uh, section, a different school district. Lee's was in a different school district than I was, but all the farmers knew each other. 
they all kind of hung out and they all had uh, quite a communication. So the farmer kids in my district were like shoving me into the lockers and tripping me and hitting me. And, you know, that's for Lee. What'd you do to our buddy Lee? Yeah, this is for Lee. I'd get beat up. Uh Uh, It was tough all through high school for Lee. And some of the kids, none of the farm kids, but some of the other kids, everybody knew the story. Uh, totally believed me. Of course, my parents totally believed me. Um, the police didn't. We, um, Lee's, okay, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, Lee's funeral, um, was, of course, a few days later. I didn't, I didn't go. I, don't, I can't remember if my parents went. But uh, we went back to church about a week or so lo- uh, later, and nobody was, like, talking to us. Uh, Lee's parents would just glare at me and wouldn't speak to my parents. Uh, it was, oh, you could feel the hostility. And after church, uh, the minister came up and talked to my parents. Again, they had me go sit in the car. And when they got to the car, they said, well, this is the last time we're coming back to this church. So I don't know if we were asked to leave or whatever happened, but we never did go back. So anyway, all through high school, uh, beat up and pushed and everything, you know, when you're going to come clean uh, about what you did to Lee, I finally graduated. As soon as I graduated, I left the town and never moved back. My parents left town too, sold the house. We got out of there. And now and then over the years, I would hear from some old classmates and it would be the same thing. When are you going to come clean about what you did to Lee? You would think that, you know, people would have a spiritual experience somewhere and know that there's something beyond just the physical. Well, I graduated high school in 1973. So last year, last August was my 50th high school reunion. And I never went to any high school reunion because I didn't want to be around those people. But I figured for the 50th, you know, you know, we're down to just a few surviving class members. I thought, well, I'll go back. You know, it might be kind of fun to go back. And I made arrangements and was going to fly back. A week before the high school reunion, I got a call and I was officially uninvited to my no. classroom because of Lee. And several of my classmates were trying to find distant relatives of Lee's to see if they could force um, reopening the case on what happened to him. And I was like, oh, <sighs> God, that was last August. And it was like after, so, so Lee died probably 55 years ago. And I'm guessing probably about then, probably 69, 70. I don't even remember. I can't even remember his last name right now. Um, and these people have held on to this all this time. I never had like some enlightenment, never had some experience and, and think, oh yeah, I remember this guy and, and he found, uh, you know, saw the spirit of one of our dead friends. Uh, they just never unfolded. And uh-huh. to me, it was just an absolute blessing. And to my parents too, a blessing to find Lee's body. Otherwise we may not have found it till, you know, for months, you know, when they would finally mow the weeds out of the gully, and also to get to share his very last message to his parents, and kind of like what happened with Penny. This has happened actually a couple of times. It has, um, yeah. What an honor! Uh, yeah, yes, I have been so blessed. I feel so honored to get to share that with him. You would think that would be a relief for his parents to find his body, and and, and you know his apology to his mom. You know, evidently for not listening to her about the motorcycle or, you know, having the rack. She That's wasn't that. there. She wasn't in a place to receive that message at the time. She was in shock. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And they held on to it for the, for years, you know, and then finally we just, we all just left the state and that yeah. was it. It's nothing you can do. But for me, it was a blessing and it, you know what a tragedy it was. I got a lot out of that. I am so grateful. I am so grateful spirit allowed me to get to see his body. And was he waiting for me? I don't know. Was he there that anybody that could see spirit would see him? I don't know. I don't know the answers. But for whatever reason, I was able to honor my friend and give his his last message. 
And I carry that with me all this, all this time, 55 years now. I think this is a great segue into you working in hospice. You've had similar experiences seeing spirit and someone showing you their transition. Would you mind sharing some of your experiences or like some of your, like the most meaningful experiences that you've had in, in hospice? Yeah, this, I have this one. This one was just amazing. I, uh, I have told this story to my friends and coworkers and everybody all over the years. What an incredible gift one of my patients did for me. And I feel things. I see things and I feel things. And you know, uh, when I wake up in the morning, you know, the first thing I say is, Spirit, use me in whatever way that will serve humanity better or serve you better. You know, uh, sometimes we try to direct what's going to happen in our day. I just kind of turn it over to that which is eternal and has a much higher viewpoint than I do. And I say, use me. If you need my hands and my feet and my mouth, use it. Let's do it. And it would be so frequently on my way to work, I could feel what kind of patients I was going to have that day. I could feel what needs that they were having. And we had under hospice, our average patient lived 72 hours. Um, now and then we would get some healthy people to come in for some symptom management, like pain control, and then we'd send it back home. But very often our patients just came in to die. And I could just kind of tell, you know, what am I going to need for one patient? What am I going to need to do for another? Just before I got there, because I just opened myself up to, to spirit to use me. And I got, there's one shift. Um, I got there and, and there was this woman. And I was just drawn to her. I don't know why. I, I looked up her name and it's like, I don't remember her. And I looked at her. I don't remember. There was just some, com- some bond that, uh, that was going on between, you know, I don't know if she had it with me, but I had it with her. She was dying of something. I don't recall what she was, um, non-responsive. She would, uh, moan if we turned her. She wouldn't respond to voice. She kind of responded a little bit to touch. So, you know, we would medicate her and we would have to turn our patients and, and we have to clean them up quite frequently. And generally we would, uh, we called it a car wash. There'd be two of us and we would go from patient to patient to patient and reposition them and comb their hair and clean them if we need to, give them medicine, um, anticipate they might be going into pain. Even if they couldn't talk to us and tell us, it doesn't mean that they're not in pain. So we would medicate them how we felt. And, and I could feel it. I could feel if they needed extra pain medicine. And it's hospice. Who cares? They're not going to be like knocking over circuit, circle K's for drug money. You know? Right. Who cares if they get addicted? <laughs> you know, uh, morphine flows like wine there. So, uh, um, you know, we took such good care of our patients. And our staff was so dedicated. It was an absolute marvelous place to work. And the people that I worked with, everybody was so dedicated to our patients. And not only we had our patients to take care of, but we had their families because the families had their backs up against the wall. What am I going to do? My daughter's dying. My mom's dying. My grandma's dying. Everybody, it was a quite a dynamic. And we had the opportunity to serve them all, the patient and the family. It was a wonderful learning experience. What a blessing it was to be a hospice nurse. But anyway, um, something was going on down the hallway and somebody needed a little extra care. So I was heading down the hallway. And when I walked down the hallway, you check in everybody's room just to make sure everything's okay. You know, make sure they didn't need anything or you know, something wrong going on. And I was going by this woman's room and she's sitting up at the side of the bed. The side rails were down. She was on the side of the bed. She looked fabulous. Woman had to be in her seventies or much older. And, uh, she's sitting inside the bed and her hair, hair looked good. She had a great big smile on and you know, she's just smiling at me. And I'm going, Hey, looking pretty good. And I walk on down the hallway and I stop and think, wait a minute. <laughs> this woman's in a coma. What the heck is she doing sitting on the side of the bed? It's like, wait a minute. You're not. I'm not supposed to sit on the side of the bed. So I take my, I'm walking backwards. Thinking, I didn't see that, did I? And I get back to her room and I look in her room and she's back in bed. The side rails are back up and 
she has this thing called agonal breathing. That's where all the muscles really, really start relaxing. It sounds awful, but it's, mm. it's really not. And the woman's back in a coma. And it hit me because I had just taken care of her and she was missing a leg at the hip sometime a long time ago because the, the wound was long since healed. And when I saw her sitting at the side of the bed, she had two legs. Wow. She had two legs. She looked like she was about 30. Her hair was done. She was smiling. She looked gorgeous. And then I come back here and it's this old, old woman with one leg laying there. And I just thought, you're getting ready to go. And you just so showed me your soul. You showed me your soul while you're still alive. And I was just like, oh my God, this, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for showing me this. And I said, well, go. You know what to do. You're, you're like the butterfly that comes out of the cocoon and you're stretching your wings and getting them dry and getting them ready to fly off. You know what you're doing. You know, go ahead and go. Uh, you know, I'll take care of all this. You get and you go and, uh, and be happy and, and go into your next adventure. And I was just like beaming. I couldn't wait. So I ran back to the nurse's station. I told everybody what I saw and they're all think, Oh, that's so cool. Cause they're seeing stuff too. I mean, we worked in the house, house of death. I mean, everybody comes there pretty much to die. So anyway, we made it through the shift and, uh, she's still alive. Um, I told the oncoming shift what's going on and they're thinking, Oh, that's so cool. You know, thanks for sharing that. And they're running in there looking to see if, you know, they can see her sitting on the side of the bed too. So, um, you know, I drive home and I go through the front door and down the hallway, there she is. She's standing in my hallway, completely solid in like a robe. She looked probably 26, 27, 28, 30, somewhere around like that. Her hair it looked like she just got out of a salon. It was just kind of wavy and kind of came down. Um, she had some lipstick on. Like, yeah, she looked gorgeous and was just smiling, just wow. smiling. Beam, just beaming. And I'm sitting there saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my God, thank you for showing me this. And then she just slowly faded away and there she was going, oh, I'm just all goosebumpy and everything. Every time I tell this, I get goosebumpy. So I ran to the phone and I called work. I said, you need to go check on the lady in room two. I said, I think she just passed. And I said, well, we just came out of there. She's still here. I mean, she's not doing well, but she's still here. I said, no, go look, go look. So they put the phone down. They go, look, she had just passed. Wow. And of all people, I don't know why she shared this with me. And I, I have no idea who she was. I, I don't think I ever met her before. I, I know I've taken care of so many people who knew. But I would think she would have loved ones or someone to show herself to, but she showed herself to me and she followed me home and showed me self, showed herself. She showed me her soul before and after death. Wow. Well, it, you're an open vessel. Uh, you were so receptive to this and, and she probably knew that it just, that's just it. what happened. You were so blessed to have that experience. That was like winning the lottery. It truly was. All these things are like winning the lottery. What a blessing it is to serve. And I hear, I hear, I hear people so upset with the, their lives because they're not receiving the things that they want. They're not getting the income that they want. They're not getting the love that they want. They're not getting this, that, and the other that they want. And, and they seem so upset. I think the key is not what you get. It's what you give. Mm. And, I am so appreciative for every little single thing that happens to me. And when spirit shows me one thing and I'm just sending it so much appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The door just floods open. It just more keeps come coming. And it's, it's not what you get. It's what you give. And I give that appreciation to the universe and support and uplift every single spirit that's ever come to my life. And even the ones I didn't see, like with my patients, what an honor it was to serve my patients. They have been my best teachers throughout my entire life. And, uh, and this woman, I don't even know her name. I don't even remember her name, 
And that happened, oh my gosh, probably back in the 1990s. And wow. it's just like, I can see her right now. I can see her in my hallway right now. That's Thank so you. cool. I never saw her after that. Didn't need to. We had our experience. I learned my lesson. I got my gift. And, and now I'm sharing it with you. Oh, and I'm so grateful for you sharing this. Thank you so much. Yeah. And how was it working with the kids? Did you have any experiences with them? Was there anything like that with the children? Kids that were about 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, around that age group, had a spiritual experience that I didn't see anywhere else. I didn't see with our older or our younger children, or at least they didn't share with me. And I never heard this experience with our adult um, patients. And many of them would share what they were seeing. And a lot of times I would see what they were seeing too, which is past loved ones coming into the room and talking to them. The children that we had that were conscious, and not all of our children were drugged up. Not all of our kid needed, kids needed a lot of medications. They would see what we would describe as a gray alien. I don't know if they were aliens. But the way you would describe an alien with a, you know, short and the long arms and long fingers and skinny, skinny, skinny. But what the kids saw were just like that, except the heads were very, very skinny too. And everybody else describes an alien with a, with a fat head. I have right. never seen a gray, but, and at the time I'd never heard of a gray. I knew nothing about UFOs or anything like that. And I just thought they were skinny spirits that came for children. Because the, the kids would see them and usually enjoy their company, either be neutral to them or laugh and interact with them. And some children w would scream and hide from them and try to get away from them. But we had one room that uh, we had three beds in it. And we had usually put our sickest kids in that room because you could stand there and and it was open. And I could take care of all three really sick kids without running up and down the hallway. And, you know, we had to change their dressings or tubes or whatever it is, you know, ventilators, whatever it is we had to do, we did. But there was a solid wall partition between each bed uh, from floor to ceiling. So it's, the kids couldn't see or hear, you know, what's going on in the next bed. But if we had three conscious kids in that room, which we generally didn't, now and then we'd have one or two that, you know, that was uh, able to talk and carry on somewhat of a conversation. They would be looking at the same place at the exact same time, laughing and responding to whatever it is that they were seeing at the exact same time. And sometimes they would quote what they were seeing, these beings, and, and say the exact same thing. So several times, you know, they were repeating back what was saying, and it would sound like, E to me re do ta me. It'd be like that. That's it's not a quote, but that's what it sounded like. And the kids would say the same thing at the exact same time. No way. At the same place, but they couldn't hear or see each other. So I know they were seeing this. And of course, we had kids that were you know were non-responsive, and, and we got nothing from them. And some kids were on a lot of medications, but even if they were, if they're responding to the same thing that is invisible physically, something's going on. And we also had seven private rooms down the hall. The kids there had no chance of interacting with anybody else. They would see these things. And this went on for five years that I was there. It's not just this happened once or twice. It happened repeatedly. Again and again and again and again and again. The same descriptions, the same things that they saw. Some kids uh, were terrified, absolutely horrified by them and would, you know, try to get away or hide under the, the, the blankets or whatever. But a lot of kids were afraid of me because, you know, I'm, I'm the mean nurse with the needles. I'm the mean nurse with the nasty tasting medicine. So it's not that I did anything bad to them. They were just afraid. So when those children were afraid of whatever these beings were, was it truly because there was something horrible to be afraid of or were they just afraid? I don't know. 
It could have been their appearance too. Maybe they weren't used to it. Did any of the kids draw these beings? Somewhere in one of my boxes, I hope I still have it. I have some of the sketches that the kids did. And, uh, and this is interesting. I worked at the time I was working night shift and several of the day shift nurses were very disturbed by this because they were very traditional religion, um, nurses. And the kids would draw a picture of, uh, of these beings. And then the nurses would add wings to them and a halo and say, Oh, look, um, they're, they're drawing angels. But the children never once said there were angels. They never said anything about a halo and none of them had wings. Uh, but some of these very religious fanatic nurses that we had 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 to make it into an issue to support their own belief system. And what a shame that was. And when I would share my stories, you know, with a different staff that would listen to it, they would change it and said, oh, David said they saw angels again. It's like, no, I never said that. And we had to be very cautious how we talked about the, about this with the children. Because if the parents were staying you know, in, in the same room and you know, next to the kids, I didn't want to freak them out that the kids are seeing something that none of us can see. So I had to be very judicial, judiciously how I asked the children and spoke about it with them. I didn't want to, you know, the parents would think, oh my God, there's demons in the room. I didn't feel demons. I never saw these beings. And of all the stuff I saw, I'd never wanted to see something more than to see what the children were seeing. And I would sit there and shut my eyes and say, please let me see you. I would love to see you. We're, we're on the same team here, I think. you know. And I never did. Never once saw them. Well, who's to say they weren't angels? I mean, what is an angel really? We don't know what they look like, right? No idea. They could have been, but they never used the term. Right. And I, I have gone out of my way every time I relate um, – one of my my experiences to keep it just to the facts. I don't read into anything because I don't know. I don't know this. I don't know that. I had the experience. You know, I feel I didn't feel bad anything from them, other than the few kids that were were terrified, but were terrified of other things too. Uh, the children had a very positive uh, response to these beings. I don't know. I don't know who it was, but that went on for five years. And it happened with other nurses, too. It, uh, you know, it wasn't just me. I mean, the kids were seeing it but even on my days off and the other nurses. It was, seemed to be more night shift, but a lot of things happened more at night shift because it's so much quieter. You don't have all, you know, the doctors running through and all the volunteers coming through and the families mm-hmm. and everybody during the daytime and the kids that could eat, which we had few. Um, they would get three meals a day and there's a lot of busy kinetic energy going on in the day shift at night. Everything just slows down and you can see things easier, easier in the, when it, when it darkens. So who wow. are they? I, don't, I, don't I would know. love, if you find those sketches, would you mind sending them over to me so I could include I sure it will. in the video? I've got like, I've got like loads of boxes from 20 years ago when I moved, I still have an open. I hope I still have them. And, um, and if nothing else, I could probably recreate it, but they had very long fingers and very long hands and they were very skinny. Every child saw them just the same and the place is no longer there. And cause I always thought, well, maybe there was something in the, the area, the land or something, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a house now. Speaking of children seeing beings, you had an experience when you were a child with your grandmother. Um, yeah. The Easter Bunny. That was bizarre. I sat on that for almost 65 years. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. Your support means the world to me, and I will see you in the next video.